Welcome to the March Jumpstart program celebrating Dr. Seuss. I'm Justin Clark. Today I'll be reading The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see, today, where the Lorax once stood, just as long as it could, before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax, and why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere, from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old Onceler still lives here. Ask him. He knows. You won't see the Onceler. Don't knock at his door. It stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of miff muffered moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters, and sometimes he speaks. He tells the Lorax he was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail, and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole, his grovulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by a whisper, my phone, for the secrets I tell you are for your ears alone. Slup! Down the slups, whisper my phone, to your ear and the onceler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with the teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the songs of the Swami Swans rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffula fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffula trees! All my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I would do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffula tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill, and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a knee. The instant I'd finished, I'd heard a gazoomp. I looked. I saw something pop out of a stump. Of the tree I'd chopped down, it was a sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish, and brownish and mossy. He spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of that truffula tuff? Look, Lorax, I said, there is no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a thneed. A thneed is a fine something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. 
You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool need. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the need I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety eight. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor stupid guy. You never can tell what someone will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wensler family to get it mighty rich. Get over here fast, take the road to the North Niche, turn left at Weak Hawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all in the factory I built, the whole Wensler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting needs, just as busy bees, to the sound of the chopping of truffula trees. Then, oh baby, oh, oh how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off truffula trees at one smacker. We were making needs four times as fast as before. And that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I am the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbalutes who play in the shade in their barbalute suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, Thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go around. And my poor barbalutes are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They love living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried and sent them away. I, the onceler, felt sad as I watched them all go. But business is business, and business must grow regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not. But I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory. I biggered my roads. I biggered my wagons. I biggered the loads of the needs I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more needs. And I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffed. He snarled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a cruffulous croak. Onceler, you're making such smuggulous smoke. My poor swami swans, why, they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. And so said the Lorax. Please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about the gluppity glup. Your machinery chugs on, that day and night without stop, make it in gluppity glup. Also schluppity schlup. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old onceler man, you. You're glumping the pond where the humming fish hummed. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins, get woefully weary, in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you. I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering. 
turning more truffula trees into needs, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree when we heard the tree fall, the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more needs, no more work to be done. So in time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under smog smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you who cares an awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the Wensler. He lets something fall. It's a truffula seed. It's the last of them all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and the truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack, then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. Thanks for joining us for Jumpstart. Be sure to tune in next month and join us for more great stories and activities.